TNT Sports presents the NASCAR Winston Cup Series. Today, it's the invitation-only Budweiser oh, shootout at Daytona on a cloudy, breezy, and wet February Sunday here in Florida. Let's take you to the front row, and here's Marty Snyder. Well, Bill, it's a very interesting front row. Kenny Wallace, the class clown, is on the outside of the front row. He pushed his brother here to the win in 1998. He says, hey, it's someone's turn to push me to the win. But the big story's on the other side. Kurt Busch, the qualified 43rd for the Daytona 500, but more importantly, just got his car to the grid. That's not going to do much for your nerves, is it, Kurt? It's just like the six-pack, you know, the Budweiser shootout. Brewster getting that car, but uh, we got our car here. We got a good shot starting up front, so we're going to give it the best shot. I mean, for us to learn, it's what we're going to try to do and try to help out with all the other Roush cars. We know we're struggling. We know we got to get better. He said, that's all I want to do. I just want to learn today. I don't think I have a shot to win the race. Matt? Marty sophomore Casey Atwood borrows his old car from new teammate Jeremy Mayfield to make his first Budweiser shootout appearance. He told me just moments ago the biggest item on his agenda today is just to learn. He's got tons of veterans around him. Dale Jarrett will start right in front, Rusty Wallace alongside, and Sterling Marlin right behind. He knows next weekend is the biggest day and could be the biggest win of his career. He's hoping to learn a lot today, but then again, he says four drivers in the past have won in their first Budweiser shootout appearance. He's on a drive for five to Dave Burns. Matt, this is Bobby Labonte's ninth shootout. The best he's ever finished in it is third. How do you win today starting 14th? Man, we just got to be there, uh, you know, all, all day long. It's a long race, required pit stop, and uh, try to get up front. Our interstate batteries, Pontiac's running pretty good, so hopefully he can get up there. He'll need a partner, and if he can, he'll win the thing today. Bill? Okay, Dave, what he needs to do right now is climb in that interstate batteries, Pontiac. 22 drivers, 70 laps, $200,000 to the winner. The fans are here. The sun is out. We take you to the infield for the words you've been waiting to hear. And now for the most famous words in motorsports, the Grand Marshal of the 2002 Budweiser shootout at Daytona, Mr. Jim Bragg. Gentlemen, start your engines. starting dead last in between 20 guys that can't wait to get going. Here are three more guys that can't wait to get going. Up to the booth, Alan Bestwick, Benny Parsons, and Wally Dollenbach. That is the truth, Bill. So excited about being here at Speed Weeks and getting the new racing season underway. BP, Jeff Gordon starting last. Great setup. Can he pass everybody and win? Yeah, I wondered that same thing myself. So I talked to Robbie Lewis this morning. He said, eh, I think we can. We can make up a couple of positions on pit stops. We interviewed Jeff Gordon, and he said he thought he could get there. But it's going to be very difficult. He's got to have someone help him, maybe two someones, help him push what? him through that I, field. I, I don't think he's good by himself. It'll be fun watching him try story. to get there, that's for sure. Wally, this new rules package the drivers are racing under today, Benny talked about 22 guys with a head start on Why? climbing out about the Daytona 500. Is that what this race is all about? And this is about the money. The winner gets $200,000. If a driver's got a good deal, 50% of that, 100 grand, give Uncle Sam 40%, man, you're sticking $60,000 in your pocket at the end of the day for 70 last but, uh, work. What's trying that's to what it's all funny. about. I like you to remember Uncle Sam's part I in there, though. Money. Never forget yeah. Uncle Sam. Well, what about, what about the sad music right, part? All right, we've got the first green flag action of the 2002 NASCAR Winston Cup Series season, the yes. Budweiser shootout at Daytona. The starting lineup, well, the lineup introduces right, itself to you more likely when we come back after this. I know it was crazy, but... 22 drivers getting set to sprint 70 laps at the Daytona International Speedway in the opening action of the 2002 NASCAR season. It's the Budweiser Shootout coming up live on TNT. Rained a little while ago. The track is now dry, though, and you see the field has rolled onto the speedway to make their parade and pace laps. Normally, we introduce you to the starting field. Let's do something a little different, a little fun today. Let's let the starting field introduce themselves to you. 
I'm Kurt Busch, and I'm on the pole for the Budweiser shootout. I'm going to keep everybody behind me. I tell you what, I drew good. I drew second. That's where I want to be. Let's see if we can stay up there all day. I'm the defending champion of this race, so you better watch out. Hi, I'm Kenny Schrader. We're starting fourth. We've won it a couple times. We've had some big problems here, too. I'm Bill Elliott, starting fifth in the Budweiser shootout. Hi, I'm Ricky Rudd, driving the Havlin Taurus. I'm starting sixth in the Budweiser shootout. I'm Terry Labonte. I'm starting seventh in the Bud shootout. I'm Ryan Newman, and class begins with the Budweiser shootout. Hi, I'm Dale Jarrett, and hopefully we'll have our UPS Taurus up front before you know it. Hi, I'm Jimmy Spencer, and I start 10th in the Budweiser shootout. I'm Casey Atwood, and I'm starting 11th in the Budweiser shootout. Hi, I'm Rusty Wallace, and I'm starting 12th in the Bud shootout, but look for me to get to the front. Hi, I'm Sterling Marlin. I'm starting oh, yeah. 13th in the shootout. Oh, yeah. Hey, I'm starting 14th in the Budweiser shootout, but I sure do want to end up in front. Hi, I'm Ricky Craven, driving well, 9th, and I'm starting 15th in the video. Bud shootout. Hello, I'm Dale Hart Jr., no. and I'll be starting 16th, but I'll be the one up front in the Bud Light shootout. Hey, I'm Stacy Compton. I'm starting 17th in the Bud shootout. I'm Mark Martin, and I'm starting 18th in the Budweiser shootout. Hey, I'm Jeff Green, starting 19th in the Budweiser shootout. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Bodine. I might be starting in the back, but hey, I won this thing before, so uh, it's time to win it again. Hi, I'm Todd Bodine. I'm going nowhere but to the front in the Bud shootout. I'm Jeff Gordon. I'm starting last in the Budweiser shootout, but I won't plan to be there long. You sure wouldn't expect Jeff Gordon to be there long, too. Tell you another good reason. Talked about this being a good test for the drivers and teams. We all get to get used to the drivers who've changed rides and the different color schemes today, too. At the Daytona International Speedway, waiting on the start of the Budweiser shootout, the first green flag action of the 2002 NASCAR season. It rained just a short while ago here at the Speedway, so they're going to make a couple of extra parade and pace laps. Make sure the track is completely dry. That spot on the Speedway, particularly turn two, is drawing some concern right now. Let's try to talk to Tony Stewart, check on the racetrack. Tony Stewart, Benny Parsons, you read me? Yeah, Benny, go ahead. How does the track look, especially over in turn two? I think it's fine. I think it's race ready. Well, good enough. What are your thoughts now as you're getting ready to start the 2002 season? I'm uh, excited. I mean, we didn't have much of an off season, but I can tell you, this is uh, this is the seat that I always want to be in on Sunday, and uh, look forward to getting back in the cars. So I'm real excited right now. Good luck to you, man. Tony Stewart getting set to go from third position in the Budweiser shootout. Going to be at least another lap and a half before the green flag, so let's take the opportunity to squeeze in a commercial break here. We'll be back for the start. Welcome back to the Budweiser shootout on TNT. A special race of 70 laps in length. They will need to stop for fuel, but they have to make a mandatory stop in order to change two right side tires. That's really the only specific rule to the Budweiser shootout. Let's go to Matt Yoakum. If crew member changes and safety storylines this weekend begin the whole year. NASCAR mandated that all crew members that go over the wall must wear fire suits and safety helmets. You can see the Pennzoil team, they've all got helmets on. These guys will go over the wall. A great opportunity this race for these guys to try out this new safety paraphernalia in race-ready conditions. Marty? Well, Matt, those rules were made for very good reasons. Remember the bad pit road accident at Homestead where three members of Ricky Rudd's crew were injured? I'm happy to report that all three of these guys are back. Kevin Hall, the front tire carrier, Bobby Burrell, the front tire changer, and John Bryan, the jackman, are back at work full steam. They started practicing the first week in January, haven't missed a step yet. I asked them if they were nervous. They said, no way. We work today early on in the ARCA race. Alan? 70 laps, some $966,000 on the line, and a chance to test out the new rules at Daytona. We're about set to start the 2002 NASCAR season as the pace car heads for pit road, and Kurt Busch leads the field to the start of the Budweiser shootout. Wow, the 28 car had trouble getting up to speed there. I don't know if he Loss of transmission or miss, probably more than missing a shift. 
So Ricky Rudd in trouble before they get to turn one. Everybody behind him, a good job to keep from causing a wreck. And Ricky Rudd, if that car isn't running, will not make it back to pit road. It jumped out of gear, guys. Ricky said it jumped out of gear. All right, Joe, thanks. So that's the story on the 28. 97 is Kurt Busch, one is Kenny Wallace. And 20 is Tony Stewart as he literally pushes Kurt Busch to the front. This is on board Ricky Rudd. He's down at the end of the backstretch. Actually, he's only about halfway down the backstretch, so he's definitely not going to make it back around. He's got first gear only, so he might make it back out. In first gear only, he's going to try to make it to pit road. Okay, Bill, thanks. Yeah, there it is. It's running. But first gear is he can only run about 60 or 70 miles per hour in that gear. But sometimes what happens, especially on a restart, if you try shifting real fast, it gets hung up. And, and actually make the, the, the gear shifter moves, but it gets hung up in first gear. They could probably jack that car up and get it fixed, but otherwise the shootout, not gonna gain a whole lot. That's the point. Experience, unless they want to learn something, but they have another car. They have a teammate, the UPS car. Dale Jarrett is out there and they can get the feedback from him. And watch Tony, Terry Labonte go through the middle. I said it couldn't be done. We just saw Labonte do it. I'm not sure if he went to the middle or he got put in the middle, but that's racing from fourth on back. Kurt Busch, Tony Stewart, Kenny Wallace up front. So much for there being no three wide racing under this rules package. Well, don't forget, we're still on fresh tires here, so you're gonna, if you're going to get away with it, now's the time to race when you can. Up the inside comes Bill Elliott in the red number nine. Working on Ken Schrader for fourth. This is Elliott. The 19 is Casey Atwood. And yes, that is Casey Atwood for this race. Jeremy Mayfield will have that ride for the Daytona 500 and the season. But Casey Atwood is in that car for the Budweiser shootout. Ricky Rudd behind the wall. And Tony Stewart has moved up into that second spot. Now, that second pack that kind of got separated off in that shuffling around run in the opening lap, they've caught up. Now we're going to get to see what these rules are going to do. Stewart to the outside, a drafting push from Kenny Wallace. New leader. And that's the place that I saw all the passes made last night in practice on the outside. You would think the bottom of the racetrack is the place to be. It was not in that practice session, and the pass was made by Tony Stewart on the outside. Kurt Busch quickly getting pushed back in that inside line. Fifth, now fighting for sixth. Here's Bobby Labonte, going to look low on Schrader for third. Dale Jr. is pushing him. Jr. started 16th. He's now up to fourth, just five laps in. Now, they moved to the inside and was able to pass Schrader on the inside, but the cars moved down. They were able to get some draft and help on the bottom. On board with Dale Jarrett as he goes in turn three behind Bill Elliott. The six car is Mark Martin. Dale Jarrett showing in ninth place right now. One of the things we saw in yesterday's butt pole qualifying when cars are out one at a time on the track. As you see the field coming up on the back of Ricky Rudd, who's just come off of pit road onto the speedway. We'll check up on Rudd just in a second. One of the things that we saw yesterday was that the Ford seemed to be at a disadvantage running one at a time. We're going to find out today if they're competitive in the draft. Bill, what about Ricky Rudd? Allen, it was just locked up. He pulled behind the wall. They jacked it up. Raymond Fox dove under there. We gave it a good whack. Ricky said that fixed it, and off they went. And obviously, they're going to stay out there for just what Benny said, the experience and maybe helping a buddy. His buddy's coming up on him right now. His buddy would be Dale Jarrett, his teammate. Jarrett goes by, Rudd on the outside, but he's not able to get behind him and help push. Little anxious up front. 
And Got Bobby Labonte, and Junior goes by the one car of Kenny Wallace. Here comes the 36. Labonte started 14th. I was going to say he got two sets of teammates there, but Kenny Wallace couldn't latch on to Dale Earnhardt Jr. Dale Earnhardt Incorporated teammates. Kenny's going to get shuffled. This, this is Bill Elliott. What about Bobby Labonte, Marty? Well, he's running very well, Benny, and they did not know what to expect today. About five laps into the happy hour practice for the Budweiser shootout, Bobby Labonte lost his engine, and they are very concerned in the Gibbs camp. They are sending all of the Daytona 500 engines back to Huntersville, North Carolina, where they will rebuild them because a piston let go in Bobby Labonte's race engine for this race, and the same piston is in their Daytona 500 engine. That's close with Kenny Wallace up there. And it's probably the same piston. And we see three wide. Kenny Wallace is still the meat in the sandwich. Oh, contact there. Tom Ryan nips the side of Kenny Wallace. And Jeff Gordon's right behind all this. Here's Gordon's view. Jeff Gordon started 22nd last time by. Was running in 20th position. So he's only picked up one spot. Throw uh, Ricky Rudd out of the mix because he's three laps down. And yet, Bobby Labonte started 14th and he's up to second. Just underway. Nine of 70 laps completed in the Budweiser shootout at Daytona. Tony is the lead race. New leader in the Budweiser shootout at Daytona, Bobby Labonte has shuffled his teammate Tony Stewart out of line. Here's how it happened just a lap ago. Going down in turn one, Bobby Labonte gets a great run, moves out on the inside. Junior in the eight car goes with him. By goes Bobby Labonte, by goes Junior, Schrader. Tony Stewart's fallen all the way back to about eighth in line by now. The NBA on TNT and TBS. A lot of action coming up this week. Tuesday night on TBS, New York Knicks and the Orlando Magic. Our game bet game. Michael Jordan and the Washington Wizards visit Shaq, Kobe, and the LA Lakers. Wednesday night on TNT, it's Phoenix and Minnesota. Kevin Garnett, center spotlight. And then Thursday night, it's Washington and Sacramento. A couple of teams on the way up. Teams leading out west. It's coming up this week, the NBA on TNT and TBS. <laughs> Jeremy Mayfield is slowing down. Casey Atwood, the big thing. I'm sorry. I'm getting a head start on this week. I made the change in my head to, to Jeremy in that 19 car already. I wonder how many times I'm going to call the 19 guard Casey Atwood before the year's over, but Alan did it first. I got one. Put your donation in the bucket, Alan. Tony Stewart shuffled back to eighth spot after leading just a couple of blocks ago. There he is, back there trying to squeeze to the inside of Rusty Wallace. Which was great until they got to the straightaway. Yep. They had no drafting help. Then the parachute out, came out the back. Second group of cars is being headed by Mark Martin. They're trying to pull up and join this lead group. A couple of cars behind Mark. They're double wide, and that's not helping the draft. See, Jeff Gordon has moved his way through there. Gordon started 22nd. He's up to 13th. And that's Jeffrey Bodine right behind Mark Martin and James Finch's cards, number 09. There we see Gordon. As you said, last time by was 13th. He's on the outside line with some help from Kenny Wallace in the one car. And he was second in the early laps. But shuffled out of the draft, and now he's fighting back around in this traffic. Kenny Wallace's car must not be handling very well. While you see how much space he lost going down in turn one. And, and there's been a few of those cars, PP, that look like they're using a lot of space right now in the racetrack. Gap from Bobby to Bobby, back to Jeff Gordon.
in the Wallace for one car, the yellow car right behind Jeff Gordon, seemed to make a pretty good corner up in three and four that time. And that's what Jeff Gordon needs is, is the one car right behind and just pushing it by the 40 car. Matt Yoakum, what happened to the 19 car? Well, Alan Ray Abraham, the owner, just jumped off the box, and Ray, any idea what's the problem? Don't really know yet, Matt. Some, uh, for some reason, uh, threw the belts off. Or in case you said it popped, and doesn't have an oil pump belt on it right now, and that's, that's normally a sign that's over. Well, he was hoping to use this race as a big learning tool for next weekend. His lesson didn't last very long. Though. So Casey Adler is out of the race. Ricky Rudd is three laps down. That leaves 20 cars in the hunt for the victory. And we saw Rusty Wallace. I saw Rusty Wallace pass on the outside just a moment ago. Tony Stewart did the same thing to him that time. Rusty was down on the bottom of the racetrack trying to follow the line of cars. And Tony just drove by up on the outside. This. Tony Stewart once again trying to go by on the high side of Dale Jarrett. Remember, we talked to Tony during our pre race show about this new rules package, the difference from last year, and he said you're going to have to think and plot and plan your moves a lot more. Looks like he's doing that with a very strong race car right now, but he's got to work real hard to make a pass. His car looks like it's a little bit free. I don't know if it is, but it looks like the car's a little bit sideways getting off the corners, and also Russ's car looks the same. Stewart running in seventh behind Dale Jarrett just ahead of him. Bobby Labonte is the leader of the Budweiser shootout at Daytona. You're watching NASCAR on TNT. Bobby Labonte continues to lead the Budweiser shootout at Daytona, but they've been mixing it up just behind him. You've got Dale Earnhardt Jr. second, Kurt Busch third, and now Tony Stewart continuing to pick his way back toward the front. He's up to fourth. I think these guys, I don't know, BP, what it look like to you. These guys look like they're going to have to work on handling for the 500 and 1.5. A lot of these cars look like they're using a lot of racetrack. And by using a lot of racetrack, it means that they're, they're catching the car. It's not stuck as they were, say, in the past. Well, last year, that 70-degree rear spoiler and that air deflector on the roof, all that stuff planted the car into the racetrack. Tony Stewart. Take some of his telemetry, 186 miles per hour, 187, 188. You can see as he starts hitting the bank and making the car go the other direction, the car obviously doesn't want to make that go the other direction. It slows down. And he goes by Kurt Busch, takes over third spot. A little push from Ken Schrader, also driving the Pontiac, as is Stewart. And now here comes the rest of the field. Jeff Gordon and top of line continuing to draft together forward. Marty, something going on with Bobby Labonte? Well, things going very well for Bobby Labonte on the racetrack, but one slight problem. He does have a radio problem. He can hear the team. The team cannot hear him. And if you're going to have a radio problem, that's the worst kind to have because the team does not know how the car is acting on the racetrack and what changes to make on pit road or when you want to come in for a pit stop. Yeah, Bobby Labonte has some type of problem and he wants to come in. And look here at Junior. Go right by with some help from Tony Stewart. And Bobby's losing second. He's losing third, maybe fourth. Top of nine losing the fourth position. Todd started back in 21st. He and Jeff Gordon started on the last row. They're up in fourth and fifth. Does Bobby have a problem? I saw that time he went turn one very, very high. If he does, he can't tell his crew. Marty's have a problem? He said he thinks he might have a flat tire or a tire going down, Benny. The team is getting on the wall in case he does come down pit road. But I believe he's going to stay out there. Communication now between Jimmy Maycar and Bobby Labonte. And Jimmy is trying to talk to him and trying to figure out what the problem is. But again, Bobby cannot really talk to the team. They're hearing a little bit of what he says, but not the whole thing of what he says. I got you. But they did hear flat tires somewhere along the line. Look at this. Labonte low, Kenny Wallace high, Sterling Marlin in the middle. Stacey Compton, the dark green car, trying to help Bobby Labonte get by Sterling. He does. It's A.J. Foyt's Conseco machine. Pretty good stuff so far. It has been. A 
over at NASCAR.com. We've been taking your questions at TNT Race Talk. How many cars do the teams bring to Speed Weeks and why? Well, I would, the guys that are in a Budweiser shootout would probably have three cars here. Wouldn't you think, Wally? Yes. A car for the Bud shootout, a car for the Daytona 500, and a backup for both. But most of the other teams bring two cars. They bring their main car and a backup car. It's fair if they have a problem. They crash a car, they back the other car off the trailer, go through tech, they're ready to go. Dale Earnhardt Jr. is the fourth different leader of the Budweiser shootout. Dave Burns is in his pit. And Alan, not only does he get the benefit of being the leader of this race, but he also gets the benefit of cool air hitting that front radiator area. He was overheating, as were many of the cars, up through the top 10, and he was running about 230 degrees in the water temperature. That's quite a bit. So getting, he was bobbing in and out behind Bobby Labonte to get some air to that radiator, but now leading, he can get that pressure in there. And the team, in fact, is probably going to make a change when he comes in, take a little tape off the front to help that situation as well. Marty? Well, Dave, here's the deal with Bobby Labonte. He said when he went into two a little while ago, picked up a real bad push, and then all of a sudden got really loose. That's when Benny saw him going back through the field. The radio communication, they can only hear him in the tri-oval, and it's very scratchy when they do hear him. Matt? Marty reports in from Tony Stewart, the driver in the second place, number 20 machine. He says his car's a little bit tight, but that's not the biggest concern. Chris Woodward, the engine tuner, walked over to me. He says, I'm a little worried. Tony just said the water's up to 240. He's riding behind the eight car of Dale Earnhardt Jr. They're hoping he'll pull out to get a little cool air in there to cool that water temperature down, Bill. Matt originally turned the line and said he couldn't find the right line of traffic to get in. Then he finally did started coming forward. But in that traffic, he had the same overheating problem that Dave Burge was talking about. So he had to fall back, get out of line, pull off the engine, and now he's trying to move back to the front. But every time he gets in traffic, the temperature starts to go up. One more thing, just a reminder, these guys do have the pit. A lot of radio chatter right now about our original strategy, but watch for the big pack, because when they come, so are we. Didn't we see a lot of overheating on cars, even under the old rules last year? You see, one thing, what's on the bottom of Junior's car there? I noticed this morning that he had that tape completely up, and I talked to some guys, and they said they must be gambling on being out front. Because if you run that bottom taped up like that and run back in traffic, you are going to overheat. Some of the other cars you'll see have an opening in the bottom, getting some air there because that's the highest pressure. That's where the air does the most good in cooling the engine. So we'll, be, we'll be seeing a lot of tape being pulled out the front of these cars when they do make a pit stop. A Chevrolet, two Pontiacs, and a Ford occupy the top four spots. It's Dale Earnhardt Jr. leading the Budweiser shootout at Daytona. Remember, they have to make a green flag pit stop, so it should start soon. Six cars trying to break away from the pack at the head of the Budweiser shootout at Daytona. Dale Earnhardt Jr., Tony Stewart, Ken Schrader, Todd Bodine, Jeff Gordon, and Rusty Wallace are wheeling those six machines. Here's a look at TNT's original series, Witchblade. The Witchblade has many powers, but only the person who wields it can truly know them all. See the story of a woman who started out a warrior and became something more. Witchblade, every Monday night at 9, only on TNT. The first season of Witchblade, every Monday night at 9, here on TNT. Alan. Uh -oh. the, the five car, evidently Bill Weber, has gotten too hot. Looks like he's smoking. Yeah, uh, Terry Labonte just radioed in. Temperature's going up. Smoke in the cockpit. They asked him for a temperature reading, but he said they're going getting high. It's getting hot, and he has smoke in the cockpit. We'll have to keep an eye on it. Not too good. We see the Conseco car has all tape on that bottom part of his grill as well. Tell you though, Terry Labonte, the seventh fastest qualifier for the Daytona 500 yesterday in the time trials and a lot of optimism around that camp after a dreadful season a year ago here comes Bobby Labonte back to the front he drives by Terry takes over the fourth position oh, I'm sorry he's back about eighth to tenth isn't he yep Bobby is uh, 11th right now that was tenth he was trying to take didn't get the job done either he'll slide in behind big brother see 
Ricky Rudd. Ricky is three laps down on the start of the race. The transmission jammed up. So we had a foot camera on Ricky Rudd's car, the 28 Havlin car, because we wanted to show you that these drivers would use the brakes to slow down rather than backing off the throttle. But we checked this during the break, and we saw that Ricky Rudd is backing off the throttle and touching the brakes as well. My guess is that being three laps down, he's out there to learn what he can and not try to mess anybody up. Yeah, I've got to agree with you on that, because normally you, you're not getting off the throttle unless your car's got a big push and it's not turning, then you're going to roll out the throttle a little bit, but he's getting way out the gas. Push being when the front end of the car doesn't stick as well as the back and it doesn't want to turn left for you when you get into the corner. You turn left as hard as you can and the car says, no, I'm going straight. I'm not turning left. <laughs> Usually when you fight the race car, it wins. Normally it does. Halfway when they come back around, and now we're creeping in on that window of green flag pit stops. The rules for the race mandate you must come in under the green flag and change at least two right side tires. Last season, we saw some guys short pit. They came in the opening laps of the race, and they got so far behind, they ended up going a lap down. They kind of got caught out of the draft. So I think lessons learned from that. We'll see everybody come in at once. And it's going to be real important, not just the pit stops itself, but getting into pit lane and off of pit lane. Slowing these cars down right in this area right here when you're yeah, trying to get the car slowed together. down to, talk to, these spotters up here. to that pit lane entrance, yeah, we, we, those cars don't want to stop. Real easy to lock the brakes up, real easy to hurt transmission. And I talked to some crew chiefs this morning down in the garage area, and that's the concern they were talking about. Do we stop early, take a chance on losing the lap, or do we stop late? The reason for stopping early if you get out and get your tires, the caution flag should come out. You do not have to make a pit stop. You stay out, get track position. One barometer of how these new rules are working out versus the package used a year ago. Lead changes in the Budweiser shootout. You see, this is a, all a brand new format almost. They used it in 2001, 70 laps, but in 2000, only 25 laps had four lead changes, and today there's only been three. Tony, I talked to the 20. He's not saying anything yet. 40. They're looking at lap 40. Ty Norris, the spotter for Dale Earnhardt Jr., telling Tony Urey that he talked to the 20 guys and they aren't Brothers saying anything. Right They're talking yeah, about you're, maybe you're, lap 40. You're, you're just all fit together. Matt, what's going on with Tony Stewart? Well, Benny, he just came on the radio and he was talking to his crew chief, Greg Zipadell, and he says, we are going to pit with the eight car, right? He says, well, it's up to you. He says, you're darn right we're going to pit with the eight car. And he says, well, how is your car? He says, I feel like right now I'm pretty good. Now, if I have to, I can do it. He, he can go around the eight at this juncture. Okay. Right now, those six cars have broken away from the rest of the field. Junior, Earnhardt Jr., Stewart, Schrader, Todd Bodine, Jeff Gordon and Rusty Wallace, and again, Bodine and Gordon, having driven up from the last row on the grid into the top five. And here's that second and third group. The 18 back there, they're going to pit on lap 40. The 20 is still saying 40. That's more of Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s radio. Here's Bill Elliott, Stacy Compton. The 09 is Jeffrey Bodine. 20 definitely coming at 40. Jeff Green in the 30. Seven laps, at least six laps now away from what we expect to be pit stops. So let's take a break here and we'll come back for the action along pit road. Back in Daytona, pit stops are underway. The Rushville Rocket, Tony Stewart, stop already completed. Last year's winner took out of four tires, no chassis adjustments. There was some debate whether to pit with the eight. The 20 team wanted to come on one lap, the eight team wanted to come another. So Tony did his own deal. Here comes the leader, Dale Earnhardt Jr., off the track onto pit road. With him are Rusty Wallace and Jeff Gordon. And others behind as well, including Dale Jarrett, Jeff Green, and Stacy Compton. Now, how many tires will he change? Tony Stewart changed four tires. You only have to change two. Tony Stewart changed four for a better handling car. 
Well, he certainly had to change right front because he went all the way through that thing, getting to the break. How about it, Dave? What do you got going? Four tire stop for Dale Earnhardt Jr. Another car had been complaining about losing grip around the track on all four, sliding the tires. Perhaps that's the same problem for Jr. Just a wipe of the grill. Doesn't look like they took any tape off, and he's out of here. Exactly same stop as Tony Stewart. Now we'll see where they end up on the racetrack in comparison to each other and see who was able to get off and on pit road better. That's Kenny Wallace. He just took two tires on his stop. And as Junior fights to get up to speed, here comes Stewart and the others around turn two. <laughs> and Junior is pushing a hole in that firewall trying to make that thing go faster faster 41 cars jimmy spencer he had some contact early in traffic when ricky Rudd broke on the start he's got fender damage he's going a lap down here and we talk about these cars taking four or five miles to get up to speed you can see that junior is almost two and a half miles he's still not to speed some contact between him and schrader well, they had a run going. The only thing he could have done was throw a block, and that's exactly what he tried to do, because he was not up to speed compared to these cars in the draft. Rusty Wallace is the leader. Rusty is way out in front of these guys, but he's got no drafting help. Then it's Kenny Wallace second. Then you get to Ken Schrader, who's third. Dale Earnhardt Jr., Tony Stewart, Ryan Newman, all in that pack. Look at way at the top of the screen. That Wallace and Kenny Wallace, the top two. There's Kenny, second place. And farther ahead to Rusty, who is the leader. And they'll catch Kenny pretty quick, those cars in that draft. So obviously Rusty changed two right side tires as well. He and Kenny both. And here comes the pack. a four to five mile an hour difference compared to what Kenny Wallace was running and the cars that are running in the draft right now. Yeah, that's right. Rusty Wallace last time by ran 177 and a half miles per hour. Kenny Schrader leading this group ran 183 and a half miles per hour. Six miles per hour faster. And so you're Rusty and you're looking in your rear view mirror and you're thinking, what? You're a sitting duck. Because <laughs> when they catch you, they're going to blow by you unless he does a, what Little E did, and that's try to throw some kind of a block. But they're going to have so much momentum, they should be able to get around them. Sitting duck and the hunt is going to be good. Ooh. This time by, Rusty Wallace goes by the line. We'll see what kind of speed he ran that time. Oh, he picked it up. 178 and a half miles per hour. But Schrader, getting some help from Kenny Wallace, ran 185 and a half miles per hour. Here's the gap. Rusty Wallace to second place, Kenny Wallace. And that gap will be from Rusty Wallace to the pack here, about another half a lap. And you can see that Kenny getting closer and closer. I think Schrader and Stewart might have a big enough run when they get to Kenny Wallace to drive by. And he tries to block them. You know what? That's what a crew chief told me this morning, that last year you drove these races looking through the windshield because you closed so quickly on the other cars. He said, now you're going to drive the race looking out the rear window. No, no, no question. No question. These guys are looking in the mirror as much as they are out the windshield. Especially Ken, and, and like I said, Kenny was a sitting duck. There's nothing you can do. These guys are running four or five mile an hour. By the time faster, by the time they get to you, you can't do much. You can throw a little bit of a block, but you can't go too much or you're going to cause a big wreck. Now we see Rusty Wallace straight of the lead. Three tenths. A quarter of a second. Two tenths. Here he comes. See you, Rusty. And that was a good move by Kenny. He gave him a little fake job there. He kind of looked like he was going to go down low, and then he pulled it up to the right past the pine. A couple of St. Louis boys racing for the lead, but it's no contest. Ken Schrader's got all the drafting help. Now, Rusty should be able to latch on to the back of Sterling's car here and stick with this draft. I'll tell you what, Sterling Marlin, that 40 car, his crew must have done a tremendous job because he was three or four seconds behind this group. And look at Tony Stewart drive under Schrader. Who's Junior going with? No question. By himself, probably. 
That's why Tony, I think, moved down, number one, to get away from Schrader, but number two, to try to block a move by Dale Earnhardt Jr. in the eighth car. Stewart to the lead, Earnhardt Jr. to second. Here comes Marlin. Schrader couldn't shut the door. Oh, that's a terrible feeling. Being out there on the high side all by yourself. Because they're all going to go by you. And there's Jeffrey Bonine in the 0-9 car. Right up in there. Teddy Crater's going to get a little bit of help from Jeffrey. Here comes Gordon. Yep. Just kind of hanging around the back of that group for now. Now, these three cars ahead of them can make some time if they stay in line and these guys stay two by two. They'll lose that trap. If the Wallace brothers, Kenny and Rusty, had been able to come back on the racetrack together, they might have been able to stay in front of this group of cars. But the fact that they were out there by themselves, they were sitting ducks. Yep. Jimmy Spencer's just been on pit road for his stop. I mistakenly said earlier he was a lap down. He just hadn't pitted yet. He's going to be a lap down very quickly. Tony Stewart. About two-thirds of the way through the Budweiser shootout at Daytona. You're watching NASCAR on TNT. Nineteen laps to go in the Budweiser shootout at Daytona. The opening action of the NASCAR Winston Cup season live on TNT. Earlier we asked you to cast a vote at NASCAR.com in our TNT race talk about which one of the new school drivers you thought would win the most races in 2002? You have voted resoundingly. It's a landslide. Wow. Kevin Harvick for president. Oh, we won not vote for president. We had the thing open for barely an hour and 38,000 and some of you cast votes. We appreciate it. And we'll have more NASCAR race talk throughout the season as we bring you events here on TNT. Now, right about now, BP, you know, you and I really, I'm looking in the mirror, I saw you, and you really weren't my buddy late, earlier in the race. But now I'm reminding you about that Christmas gift I bought you. Uh-huh. I want to see if you're going to help me here in the last few laps. That's right. These guys are all trying to figure out who their friends are right now, because it's real important, these last couple laps, who is going to go with you and who is going to hang you out. Well, we've got, you know, what we've got, we've got two fairly young guys in the front. Junior and Tony Stewart, and they worked together in happy hour yesterday afternoon. They ran almost the entire time, nose to tail like this. Junior in front, Tony in front. Alfie Walters in that group. Now you have Sterling Marlin, Kenny Schrader, the 40 and 36, about the same age guys, around 45 years old. That leaves uh, Jeff Gordon with nobody. Well, but Kenny Schrader's got a Hendrick engine in that car. So there is a little bit of cousin rel rel you know, you're a relative, but just distant. Yeah, distant relative, that's right. I disagree with both of you. I don't think anybody out there has any friends. They all want to win. Of course they do. But they want to use someone else to help them win. Sterling knows he's gonna have to he's gonna have to have somebody go with him in order to get by those two guys. Schrader. Well that's what I'm saying. He's not gonna help Dale Jr. Check this out. Three deep. Bobby Labonte sticking those left side wheels down there below that yellow line. Looks like he got pushed down there to me. And in the driver's meeting, once again, if you are, if you go underneath the yellow line to improve your position, you will be black -tied. Watch this about a lap ago up in turn one. It's Dale Jarrett, Rusty Wallace, and Jeffrey Bodine. Hello. Wow. DJ felt that little nudge in the right rear, and you see Rusty Wallace talk about backing off the throttle, and that was the point I was trying to make. When you back off, how much momentum you lose. We saw Rusty back off, and bam, cars going by on the outside and inside. Kurt Busch, ooh, squeezing his way up in front of Todd Bodine. I thought a minute ago that this second group was organizing itself into single file to try and run up and get involved in the race for the win, but... Well, that went away. The spotters are going to start calling them a little bit closer right now than they have been the first 50 laps, too. What are some of the Winston Cup drivers who are not involved in this on-track action? Think of the rules and how they're affecting the racing. Dave Burns has got that for us. Well, Alan, Jeff Burton is watching his Roush Racing teammate Mark Martin struggle at the back of the pack. What do you think about his run as well as the guys doing great up front like Stuart and Earnhardt? Well, we figured those guys would be up there... Uh, Mark and Kurt, I can't speak for anybody else, but those guys, we're just not fast enough having Fords, and they made some sacrifices on their setups to try to go fast. 
and then he got a problem with handling. But um, we're just a little too slow right now. Do you think you can catch uh, next Sunday the 8 car, the 20 car? Seven more days till then. A lot of work we can put in. Uh, we got a work cut out for us, obviously, but, you know, it is what it is. You got to make the most out of it. This is a chess match. That's what this is. This is a different kind of race than last year. It's more of a strategic game, and uh, hopefully we can take advantage of that. Believe me, Jeff Burton is thinking about how he can say checkmate at the end of the Daytona 500 next week. These guys have been working on these cars all winter to try to make them go fast. It's going to be real difficult to make up that round between now and Sunday, and I think Jeff knows that. But That's right. He does know that, but they're at the laboratory now. You see, they were at the manufacturing plant for the last two months. They brought it to the lab. Now they're on the racetrack, and here maybe they can make some things happen. Kenny Wallace, Bobby Labonte, fighting for ninth spot. Point of reference in the five-car lead draft. There is no Ford. Pontiac, Chevy, Dodge, Pontiac, Chevy. And there are those five leaders. 13 laps to go. Who's going to get the big check as the winner of the 2002 Budweiser shootout at Daytona? We'll find out when we come back to the World Center of Racing. You're watching NASCAR on TNT. Tony Stewart leads the Budweiser shootout at Daytona. Ten laps to go right now. Dale Earnhardt Jr., Sterling Marlin, Ken Schrader, and Jeff Gordon complete the lead draft. They have gapped the second draft by four and a half seconds. It's going to be settled among these five. I, I think the 40 car is going to be the key on who's going to win or not going to win. Depending on if the 20 car and the 8 car start racing, whoever the 40 is going to go with or doesn't go with, I think that's going to be the key. If they stay like this till the end, they're going to gap back to the second group. Dale Jarrett, Bill Weber, a lot of folks think's being held up by the 12 car there, Brian Newman. Boy, Alan, you're absolutely right. With about 23 laps to go in this race, that second pack was closing on the front pack by as much as eight tenths of a second. What they wanted to do is they wanted to get Dale Jarrett in front. They got shuffled out. Jarrett fell back behind Ryan Newman. And they wanted to get Jarrett back out in front to get Terry Labonte behind Jarrett and then try and rope in these guys. As you can see, they finally got Ryan Newman shuffled out of the way. He's got five damage, so he's slow. They got the 88, the 5, the 18, and the 1. They still think there might be enough time to catch those front runners, especially Wally, when those front runners start racing for the lead. Oh, you're right, Bill. I mean, if they can all get lined up, if they can get 10 or 12 cars lined up, they will catch that first group. group. But, boy, they've got to get lined up. I don't know if they've got enough time now, unless we get a caution. They've, they've got to pick up over a half second a lap, and I just I can't see that happening because it's not changing. The distance between Tony Stewart and Dale Jarrett is just, as a matter of fact, it's growing. But they don't have enough cars. They only have four or five cars lined up right now. They need all those guys lined up. The other thing I agree, I, get, I think it was Bill that made the statement, but when those front five start racing among themselves is the key. If they start that soon, the backpack will catch him quick. If they stay in line until a couple of laps to go, then they don't have a chance. Absolutely. A couple of guys who've fallen off the pace. Stacy Compton has lost the lead draft. Jeff Green is back off the lead draft. Bill Elliott, Ricky Craven. They pitted separately early. They've lost the lead draft. You've got Jimmy Spencer a lap down. Ricky Rudd had a transmission problem on the initial start. He's three laps down. And Casey Atwood is out of the race with an engine problem. No caution so far. Leaders Tony Stewart and Dale Earnhardt Jr. have done most of it. 23 and 20 laps apiece, respectively. Now we see Jeff Gordon falling back a car length or two. I mean, that's not because he's slow, because he's trying something. He's trying to see, I guess, if he can get a run on these guys. Does he have a chance to win? Marty, what are they saying down there? Well, the other thing he's doing, Benny, is trying to get some cool air to the car because he is starting to overheat. The water's about 240 for Jeff Gordon. He will pull back to get some clean air in. He'll also duck out from behind Ken Schrader just to get some clean air to that radiator. Well, you have to be careful when you do that because you can duck out once or twice and you can lose that draft. Ken Schrader has led today. Sterling Marlin has not. All right, what's going to happen here? Six to go when they come around. Who's going to make the first move? Where's it going to come from? I think Junior has to be the guy that makes the first move, and, and what he does dictates what everyone else does. How about the leader, Matt? And 
That's exactly Tony Stewart's concern. He keeps telling his spotter, Mark Robertson, keep an eye on the eight. If he starts to back up, it looks like he's going to try to make a run. Let me know so I can throw an offensive maneuver so he can't make the move. Also, he's saying start counting me down from five laps down because I'm going to be a little bit busy. Marty? Matt, don't forget that Tony Glover and Sterling Marlin have won two Daytona 500s together. Tony just told Sterling on the radio, you are the master of the draft. Take these young boys to school and win this race. I see Marlin and Schrader trying to go. I agree. I see them knowing that Earnhardt Jr. and Stewart have the best cars, and I see them trying to get together and go soon. Dave Burns. All right, does your boy have to be the leader in this draft? Does he have to be the one to pull out and try to win? Yeah, I'm sure he's going to have to be the one to pull out. If he don't, he'll, uh, he'll be fifth for sure, because uh, it's only a matter of time those three behind him is going to get antsy. And you can't do it by yourself with these rules, so he's got to have help. Now, whether they want to help him or not, I don't know, but hopefully he can stay in front of them. All right, Junior has to be the first one to get antsy, it sounds like. I think I think that he has to be the guy that makes the move because I'm not too sure with these rules that Sterling and Schrader and Jeff Gordon can do anything with these front two cars. I think Junior's just backing up to try to get him a run. A little gap there up to Tony Stewart. Remember we heard the report from Stewart's pit a minute ago. If Junior starts to back up, let me know. That's right. Like I said, drive through the rearview mirror. But if these three guys behind him line up, they'll be able to do what they want, meaning Sterling, Schrader, and Gordon. Gordon outside of Schrader. This is for Ford. The first move is made. Gordon is up a spot. Now Sterling has a good pusher behind him because I think we all believe I think the 24 car is pretty strong. All of the moves we've seen made, almost all of them have happened on the outside. Could get a little ticklish because as you come off the corner, there's just not enough horsepower with that small restrictor plate to drive these cars up off the corner and try to get a run on someone. Three to go. Jeff Gordon, winner of the Budweiser shootout in 1994 and 1997. Sterling Marlin, a two-time Daytona 500 winners. The next man, he's going to pass. Kenny Schrader won this Budweiser shootout in two years, 18, 1989, 1990. Tony Stewart, the 20 car, won it last year. Dale Earnhardt Jr. won the most recent Winston Cup race here last July, the Pepsi 400. All these boys know how to get to victory lane here. They do know what they're doing. And Jr. with that little backup again. Here we go. Two laps to go. Looking low, Stewart to block. There are some lap cars ahead. Will they factor in the finish? They're going to come up on Jimmy Spencer's machine when they get off onto the backstretch. There's Spencer ahead. So far, no move. Jeff Gordon wants to go to the outside, but there's no help out there. Can he do anything? He looks like he might have a run. He's going for it on the outside. Fred will go with it now. Gordon for third as they come to the white flag. Last lap of the Budweiser shootout. Earnhardt Jr. fell back off of Stewart a little bit. Does he have the momentum now? Trying to force Stewart up off the bottom. Run. Cannot make it happen. Is Jeff Gordon going with him? No, Gordon's going to the outside with Schrader. Gordon getting the push. Moves to second. Junior digging back down low. Stewart's loving this in his rear view mirror. While they fight for second, that could be the gap Tony Stewart needs to win the race. Here they come, final sprint to the checkered flag. Stewart's going to do it two years in a row. Tony Stewart wins the Budweiser shootout. Earnhardt Jr. edging Jeff Gordon for second. I think the 
Tony Stewart, when he looked in the mirror and saw what was happening for a second spot, he moved over and helped Junior get the spot because Junior had run behind him for so long and helped him stay up there. Well, not only that, but I think Gordon had a run, and he was going to try to break that run because he had some momentum coming. 31 of 70 laps led by Tony Stewart. He holds them all off in the final miles to score his second straight win in the Budweiser shootout, $200,000 for that hour's worth of work. We'll talk to the combatants in the finish in a moment. There's Greg Zipidelli, the winning crew chief. We're watching NASCAR on TNT. And we welcome you back to the Daytona International Speedway in Florida, where Tony Stewart has successfully defended his championship in the Budweiser shootout. A winner last year, a winner this year, holding off a firm charge in the closing laps to make the return to victory lane. And now Tony Stewart, wearing the head and neck restraint device, climbs out of the car and gets the obligatory shower from a very happy crew. Greg Zipidelli here. Way to contribute. Congratulations. That was a that was a fun race. It looked like that's what you wanted. Yeah, my coke tastes a heck of a lot better than this beer does right now. But we had an awesome day. I mean, this car was great. All the Home Depot guys. We we stuck our game plan all day, and uh, you know we ran with Junior a lot in practice. And we knew that we were the two strongest cars. It was just a matter of us getting together. And you know, before the pit stop, we got hooked up, and he knew I wasn't going to do anything. We're just going to sit there and run. And uh, you know, I knew he'd take care of us toward the end of it too. Now, what do you mean you knew he'd take care of you? Because in these restrictor plate races, you never really know somebody's going to well, take care of you. Well, I knew he wasn't going to take care of me. I mean, uh, he may be Dale Earnhardt Jr., but he, he's got the talent of Dale Earnhardt Sr. He's uh, he's tough, and the same things his father tried to pull on the last couple laps, uh, you know, he did this year. So uh, just a matter of just trying to counteract every one of his moves with a counter move that was going to be productive. So uh, you had to watch your mirrors a lot and had to do a lot with both feet. So obviously the mirror is very important under this set of rules. How do the cars handle Tony? Well, let's put it this way. I didn't have to hold my breath at all, which is nice. Uh, you could race guys. Um, you know, we got we got back there and we were the last car in line and, and we, none of us thought we were going to be able to pass. And, you know, I started picking my way up one at a time on the outside and we were the last car of the lead group there before we pitted. So, uh, you know, anybody that says you can't pass, you can pass. And the good cars today got to the front. I mean, everybody that had a good car in practice got to the front today. So I thought it was good. Congratulations. Good luck the rest of Speed Week. Thanks, bud. Tony Stewart wants to have more fun this year and concentrate on winning. He's off to a great start here in the Budweiser shootout. We go back to Matt. And Bill Dale Earnhardt Jr. was just discussing with the Tony, Jerry, and Senior the big race in the backstretch. Yeah, it was um, it's pretty exciting. Uh, I was letting off, uh, trying to get me and Sterling a run on Tony Stewart, and every time I let off, he'd let off, and his spotters and all were telling him he was backing up, trying to get a run on him. And... Uh, Gordon was sitting back there fifth or something, and uh, he saw an opportunity to get some runs on us on the outside. Um, and so we was racing for second. It was good, though. I uh, I made him earn it, but he still uh, we still finished second. What did you learn for next weekend? Um, not a whole lot. We tried a li little bit different stuff. Tony Jr. told me just now we tried a few things, and uh, that's something we might look forward to uh, practicing with uh, later on in the week. But. Um, uh, it's a uh, learning need to be up front because it's going to be hard to get past. But Dale Earnhardt Jr. takes home a second place today in the Budweiser shootout to Marty. Well, Matt, for a guy, Jeff Gordon, who finished third, you sure were crowing on the radio about how much fun you had in this race. Uh, how difficult was passing out there, though? Well, when you start 22nd and uh, you finish third, and I thought I had second. Good. I was pretty excited. That's pretty good. So uh, we're real happy with the DuPont Chevrolet. Uh, i got to thank uh, Pepsi and Quaker State, Fritos, GMAC, and uh, new sponsor Lowe's. This is uh, great to be able to get the 200th anniversary car up there running good. Looks good. Needs to be up front there. And I was having a blast out there. I tell you what, uh, I thought that I wasn't going to be in that top five group there for a little bit. We uh, we come off pit road and, and they got out there on us pretty good. But, um, you know, I got up there and I was just biding my time. We got inside five to go and they started shuffling a little bit and it gave me some momentum to make some pass. Myself. Finish fifth. At least, at least I'm going to try real hard not to. And I uh, got a couple moves that worked for me. And, and I got a, a push from uh, Schrader there and, and I almost had a little E. That was a lot of fun. We, we were bumping and banging trying to get back to the line see who was going to. It was almost like we were battling for the win. All right, check out the line of cars here that are impounded right now. There will be a trip to the wind tunnel for one car from each make at least NASCAR mandated. Alan? All right, Marty, thanks. Had a great crowd here today at Daytona. Sat for a little rain earlier and wound up seeing Tony Stewart 
win the Budweiser shootout for a second straight year. And that was impressive. Jeff Gordon start back in 22nd position, worked his way up to third spot, but Jeff Gordon usually runs pretty well at Daytona. Pontiac wins, Chevy finishing second and third. First Dodge was Sterling Marlin in fifth. First Ford was Dale Jarrett in sixth. Jimmy Spencer had that fender damage. Ricky Rudd the transmission troubles on the start. Casey Atwood, only driver who failed to finish. He had an early engine failure. Back with more from Daytona in just a minute. Six lead changers among six different drivers today, but it was Tony Stewart who led the most laps and winds up holding the winner's trophy for the second straight year in the Budweiser shootout at Daytona. Let's go to Jim Huber. Jim. Thank you, Alan. And so we are off now on a new beginning, tantalized today, teased, set up for next week's season opening Super Bowl of stock car racing. And we leave on this excursion taking the memories of what was and the dreams of what shall be. Let's hope for the sake of a wonderful storyline that 60-year-old Dave Marcus can make next week's field, for it would be his 35th Daytona 500 and his last race as a driver. He's retiring. It would not only be poignant, but appropriate, with the old man perhaps at the back of a pack led by two virtual youngsters, Jimmy Johnson and Kevin Harvick. Between them, with 35 fewer appearances at the 500 than old Dave Marcus, and children shall lead them. How indicative of the direction the sport has taken of late, and they are not there merely to clutter the field, but to compete at the front. Kirk Bush on the pole for this afternoon shootout. Dale Jr. and Casey Atwood, Tony Stewart, Elliot Sadler, and Ryan Newman. The list grows faster than their chin whiskers as they lead NASCAR into not just a new year, but a new era. We, of course, still mourn one of the greatest losses racing has ever known. But as we come here to Daytona to commemorate Dale Earnhardt's passing, we can look ahead to a sport he left in awfully young, but awfully good hands. Alan? Yeah, that's for sure, Jim. And we saw that today with Tony Stewart, Dale Earnhardt Jr., leading the field to the checkered flag. And Jim mentioned Dave Marcus. That'll be one of the stories we follow Thursday at 1 Eastern on TNT when we bring you coverage of those Daytona 500 qualifying races. A follow-up on today and looking ahead to the qualifying races. What kind of racing did we see today with these new rules, and what are we looking forward to? Well, I, th I thought the race was better than I thought it was going to be. I think need, again, if I had a clean piece of paper, I would give them a, l give them a little bit more horsepower, about 20, 25, so they could come down the straightaway, pull out, and hope to try to go buy some. I, I think it looked good. Uh, based on the practice when I was watching in the Bud Shootout practice, it looked like the race was going to be good. I thought it was good today. Don't forget, we're going to have about 20 more cars on the racetrack when it comes uh, for the Daytona 500. So I think these guys are going to be happy with the rule change. I think we're going to see some great racing. All right, we look forward to it. Thursday at 1 Eastern time, we will see the 125-mile qualifying races here at Daytona. Next on the East Coast, the world's most dramatic police chases, and on the West Coast, it's Ronin. We'll see you Thursday here on TNT from Daytona.